you. Welcome to these seminars organized as always uh, by Geosciences Barcelona and the faculty, Facultad de Ciencias de la Terra. Uh, today's seminar will be given by Anna Rufas. She is postdoctoral research assistant at Oxford University. Thank you for coming and giving this talk. And now I will invite to speak uh, Isabel Cacho from Universidad de Barcelona, who will better introduce the speaker and the topic of this talk. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I mostly want to, to say, Anna, thanks for offering us to, to come here and, and give this seminar, very interesting seminar for, for us. Um, Anna, Anna Rufa, she, she did her PhD in the, in the University of Oxford. She actually is a biologist. Uh, I think that you studied here in the University of Barcelona, so very close to, to, to here. And then you move to Oxford, and I understand for your PhD is in the in the carbon cycle in the ocean, in the the organic pump. So the capture of the of carbon by the ocean by the organic activity, which is a really a hot topic nowadays in the in the oceans from the present perspective, from the future perspective. In my case, I look to that from the past perspective, but I found really very interesting your approach. And what is really exciting for me is to learn today uh, the perspective also from modeling that you are using there in, 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 in Oxford. And I finished her PhD last year, and <coughs> has been, the last year she has been a, a postdoc researcher in the University of Oxford. Um, I'll let you to explain us. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I think, no, I'm going to use this microphone, so I hope that the people that are connected online can, can hear us. Um, so yeah, so today uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, a model of marine snow, or biogenic marine particles, that has the mathematical attributes of being stochastic and Lagrangian. So marine particles sink from the surface ocean to the deep ocean, carrying organic carbon, and are the fundamental units of the biological carbon pump. Biological carbon pump is this mechanism that sequesters atmospheric carbon into the ocean interior. And uh, last week, I attended the Ramon Margalef uh, summer, summer Colloquia, and the biological carbon pump was front and center of our discussion. So what's what, what it's been its role in controlling uh, glacial interglacial variations in atmospheric CO2. And it was also emphasized that in recent IPCC uh, reports, the divergence between observations of, of uh, carbon sink in the ocean and what model we, models are predicting is uh, increasing over time for the uh, past decades. So, um, the oceanography community still doesn't know what are the uh, biogeochemical mechanisms that control this uh, uh, sink of carbon driven by the biological carbon pump, and that is due to the complexity of this system. So today, I hope to illustrate where the complexity stems from and how this complexity makes the carbon pump a complex system to illustrate, to conceptualize, and, and to model. This uh, model of marine particles, as, as uh, Isabel has said, has been the um, PhD research project that I did in Oxford, and this is a, uh, an ongoing project. Um, as a postdoc, I'm still working on it, so I'm still improving the model. Um, and uh, hopefully there is a lot of potential in the, in the coming years. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the outline of the talk. Um, so I will start with the fundamental questions that motivate my, my research. So what is the biological carbon pump? Why does it matter? What metrics we use to quantify it and how we observe it? Uh, I'm going to present my model. I will outline its characteristics, how I simulate marine particles and, and the biological carbon pump in which they interact. And there are so many processes, so many biogeochemical processes in this model that I'm going to focus only on two which is a, a model to seed phytoplankton cells in the surface ocean, and then a model of uh, zooplankton encounters, how they encounter food particles. Um, I will show how I have calibrated this model against uh, uh, observations of uh, fluxes of carbon, uh, calcium carbonate and biogenic silica and particle number concentrations, and I will show some local and global results 
that make this model quite unique in the sense that it outputs variables that only a, a Lagrangian model of marine particles can, can simulate at that standard biogeochemical models that are used in IPCC reports cannot. So let's dive into it. So we know that uh, sedimentary carbonate rocks are the largest reservoir of carbon in our planet. And this illustration of these white cliffs in the coast of Devon in, in Southeast England make a great illustration for this. But second to sedimentary carbon rocks, we have carbonate rocks, we have the uh, ocean water column, which is the second largest reservoir of carbon in our planet. And I think this illustration uh, uh, makes a good case for it. So most of the carbon stored in our oceans uh, is in the form of dissolved inorganic carbon. And this reservoir of dissolved inorganic carbon is 45 times the amount of carbon stored in the atmosphere and approximately 15 times the amount of carbon stored in, 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 in land, plants and soil. The second largest form of carbon in the oceans is dissolved in organic carbon, which is a subproduct of the metabolism of phytoplankton, zooplankton and bacteria. And then we have particulate forms of carbon, organic carbon and inorganic carbon, which is here in, in marine biota. Actually, particles carrying carbon, organic and inorganic, are a transient, transient form of carbon because most of the carbon is in, in, in the dissolved phase. Um, so yeah, so how has the ocean water column managed to store so much carbon? So this is due to uh, two processes that happen, the solubility carbon pump and the biological carbon pump. The solubility carbon pump is uh, driven by temperature and alkalinity. Uh, so we have in cold uh, waters and that uh, have a high alkalinity, uh, those two factors favor the solubility of atmospheric carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the ocean. Uh, and then we have uh, ocean circulation that spreads this carbon across and along the water column. Um, and we have the biological carbon pump, which is propelled by the marine food web. So we have phytoplankton, which are the primary producers of the ocean, which take up carbon dioxide and fix it producing particulate organic carbon, organic matter, and those phytoplankton groups that calcify produce calcium carbonate. So this phytoplankton sustain a, a marine food web, so you have here the phytoplankton groups, sustain a marine food web that simplified here up to zooplankton level, produce a myriad of uh, marine particles that are collectively known as marine snow. So we have, phyto, we have here phytodetritus, uh, which is dead phytoplankton cells, zooplankton carcasses, uh, mucilaginous products that are exudation products of uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. We have fecal pellets, and then this marine snow is degraded. Uh, and, uh, you know, bacteri bacteria, also zooplankton, they degrade, attenuate this, these particles, they return it into its dissolved phase, which is reused by, by phytoplankton to grow. Right, so here I just wanted to illustrate uh, this process of marine snow sinking in, in the water column um, because it is very theoretical, but it's actually something that we can observe. So this is, a, I hope with the light you can see it well, but this was recorded in the Californian coast at 100 meters depth. And you can see here snowflakes. Uh, uh, sinking or go, going upwards here, depending on how you look at. And that, that's why it's called marine snow, right? Because it, it does look like a rainfall of, of snowflakes. Right, so going back. Okay, so back to our slide. I think the video is still on. <laughs> Gonna stop this. Uh... Yeah, so I, I wanted to say that this depiction that I've shown you here of the biological carbon pump. Um, 
emphasizes the role of gravity in, 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 in the transfer of particles from the surface to the deep ocean. Um, uh, so, so we have this marine food web that produces these particles. Actually, I want also to say that the biological carbon pump usually has two sub-branches, the soft tissue pump and the carbonate counter pump. And so uh, as these particles make way to the deep ocean, uh, they are degraded, so calcium carbonate, it's dissolved uh, following the lysocline, and then organic carbon uh, um, suffers various processes that, that degrade it, so fragmentation, uh, uh, solubilization, respiration, photolysis in the surface ocean. So, but, but, but gravity is not the only process that transfers particles to the, to the deep ocean, and it was recently shown in, in this review paper by, by uh, Philip Boyd and company, uh, that there are other branches of the biological carbon pump that it's not only the, 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 this gravitational pump that is in charge of the transfer of, of uh, organic matter to the deep ocean, we have also eddy subduction pump, mixed layer pump that differ in uh, how deep they inject uh, particles to the deep ocean, and then we have uh, mesopelagic migrant pump, which is driven by organisms that perform deer vertical migration, and also organisms that, instead of uh, diurnal vertical migration, they do that on an ontogenetic basis or seasonal basis. But uh, still, the gravitational carbon pump is the one that contributes the most to the carbon export to the deep ocean. So we are not too biased with, with that depiction of gravity being at the center of the biological carbon pump. Um, yeah, so the solubility carbon pump and the biological carbon pump, they transfer dissolving organic carbon from the surface to the deep ocean, enriching the deep layers in dissolving organic carbon compared to the, to the surface ocean. And that enrichment, so, so, so there is there is here a transfer of dissolving organic carbon uh, that is against a concentration gradient. So it's not a passive diffusion which follows gradient from more to less. This is from less to more. That's why we call it pump, because it goes against a concentration gradient. And most of the dissolving organic carbon that is stored in the deep ocean and was originally in the atmosphere as dissolving organ uh, of carbon, as carbon dioxide, most of this dissolving organic carbon in the deep ocean is there because of the solubility carbon pump. But the biological carbon pump, and that's why, why it make, makes it relevant, uh, is, con contributes to the vertical gradient in the distribution of this dissolving organic carbon. So the fact that there is more dissolving organic carbon in the deep ocean compared to the surface ocean is due to the action of the bi biological carbon pump. So two thirds attributed to the biological carbon pump, one third to the solubility carbon pump. And this vertical gradient uh, is what reinforces the, the diffusion of mo more atmospheric CO2 into the ocean. So hopefully by now, more or less you understand how the, the, the biological, what's the relevance of the biological carbon pump in, in, the, in the carbon cycle in the ocean. Um, this was briefly touched in the Ramon Margalef summer colloquia last week. Uh, but it's not very, I, I have the feeling that's not very clear uh, uh, in, in biogeochemical modeling, what's the relevance of the biological carbon pump compared to the solubility carbon pump. Because we say, yes, dissolving organic carbon that was in the atmosphere and is now in, in the deep ocean is there because of the solubility carbon pump, not the biological carbon pump, but it is the biological carbon pump that uh, uh, strengthens, strengthens this gradient and uh, contributes to more diffusion of atmospheric carbon dioxide from, from the surface ocean to the deep ocean. So it's this vertical gradient uh, that makes it relevant. Um, so yeah, so we have a snowfall of marine particles from the surface to the deep ocean. And as these particles make way to the ocean interior, there are different processes that transform and degrade these particles. Um, so there are two processes that actually make these particles larger and to sink faster. So it is coagulation and the production of fecal pellets. So coagulation is when we have primary particles that collide and coalesce and stick together, forming larger aggregates of marine snow. And then we have zooplankton that encounter food particles. They reprocess them in their guts and they create compact fecal pellets, which are aggregates of food particles. 
And then uh, th those two processes transform particles, and then we have processes that degrade particles. So photolysis in the surface ocean, which is mediated by UV radiation, and destroys labile or organic carbon. And then we have fragmentation, which can be driven by zooplankton, but can also be spontaneous particle breakup. Uh, we have respiration by, by microbes, and then we have solubilization by, by bacteria. So, as we go deep down into the water column, we have an attenuation of this rainfall of, of marine snow. And this can be mathematically modeled following a power law, which is known as the Martin, as the Martin curve. And here is the equation. So we have that at any depth in the ocean, the flux of particles equals the flux of, of particles at the base of the euphotic layer, so this reference depth. Then we have a factor, and then we have this exponent, which is very relevant. It is called the Martin B, and it's the slope of this, uh, of this curve. And, and it tells us about the attenuation rate of POC flux with depth. Um, these are some uh, language formalism. So we have the, um, the, 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 the flux of POC that leaves the ophotic layer is what we call export flux. Um, and this amounts to 10% of the net primary production. Uh, then we have the POC flux that leaves the mesopelagic layer, it's called sequestration flux, and it's about 1% of the net primary production. So the remaining 99% has already been degraded due to all these processes uh, acting on the particles. And then only less than 0.1% of the net primary production makes it to the sediment, so burial. So th this is the... Oh, oh, over time, this is what forms the fossil fuels that, that we are using uh, nowadays. So this slope, this V, can be high or more steep, or can be low or more gentle. Um, and the higher this slope, high V, the higher the attenuation, the attenuation rate of, uh, of POC flux with depth. Uh, the higher the rate of change of, of flux with depth, which means that at any given depth, there is less POC in this scenario of high B than in this scenario of, of low B, right? So there is less POC because most of it has already been remineralized. So which means that in this scenario of high B, most of the remineralization occurs in the surface ocean compared this, with this scenario of, of low B. We, we have to go deeper to... Uh, uh, encounter most of the of the remineralization so we use you know this shallower remineralization length scale so in this case of high B which means that remineralization length scale is a parameter that we use to quantify um, how much POC has uh, been remineralized um, uh, how deep in the water column we have to go to encounter 63 percent of remineralization it's another formalism um, so we know that this exponent B correlates with atmospheric carbon dioxide. And so higher B, we have higher atmospheric carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And this is because of this remineralization length scale. So when it's shallower, so when, when we are in this case of high B, most of this uh, POC that is degraded, and it's degraded as carbon, uh, returned to the water column as dissolving organic carbon or carbon dioxide, it's returned to uh, shallow waters that are well ventilated and for which it takes less time to add outgas to the atmosphere compared to, to deep waters for, for which it takes more time. So that's why when we have higher B or shallower remineralization length scale, we have a higher amount of uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so we know that B controls uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that V is the balance between particle sinking velocity and organic carbon remineralization rate. And this uh, balance comes from the mathematical derivation of, of this curve. This curve was actually derived as an empirical fit to sediment trap data in 1987 by, by John Martin, which is the guy that later on came, came up with the iron fertilization hypothesis. Um, but it can also be derived from first principles, from the tracer conservation equation of POC. And um, 
it tells us that at any depth, the amount of POC that we will find uh, is the balance between the downward transport due to the settling and the amount that has been already, remi has been already remineralized. Um, so yeah, we know that B is the balance between these two and that the, the efficiency of the biological carbon pump determines this B, but we still don't know what biogeochemical mechanisms control uh, the biological carbon pump. There have been some suggestions, uh, all of them make sense. Uh, temperature, which controls uh, metabolism, heterotrophic metabolism, it also controls water viscosity, which determines the sinking velocity of particles. Um, Oxygen, again, uh, controls uh, metab metabolism. It also controls the extent of vertical migration by zooplankton. We have phytoplankton community composition, so those communities of phytoplankton that are dominated by mineralizing uh, plankton, like diatoms or coccolithophorids, those cells are heavier than picophytoplankton that don't have mineral components, so sink, sink faster, so you have ballast effect. We have nutrients and light limitation that determine the trophic state of the system. So oligotrophic areas where there are less, less available nutrients, we tend to find smaller cells compared to polar regions where there is more abundance of nutrients. When there is a welling, we have larger cells like large diatoms. And uh, zooplankton grazing. So the amount of grazing actually is, is proportional to the amount of fecal pellets that we will find in a, in a region. And fecal pellets are very heavy particles. Uh, that contribute to the higher flux of carbon to the deep ocean. Um, so, there are two schools of thought regarding the global distribution of, of Martin B in the ocean. Um, those two uh, schools of thought are actually uh, opposite. So, most of the models that we find in the literature, here I only have two, Marseille and Hanson, but the, uh, the rest can be classified in one of these two categories. Um, so in Marseille, we have that in high latitudes, we have high B, whereas in, in Henson, in high latitudes, sorry, the, the other way around, low B. In Henson, we have high B, um, and, and, and the opposite for the oligotrophic uh, uh, areas. And these discrepancies in the distribution of global patterns of B are due to the different data sets that those two models um, use. So those differences in the observations are due to the collections in the in, in sections of the so collect, collect the collection of POC flux using sediment traps. So Marseille, uh, they used uh, POC in 500 meters depth sediment traps that were uh, deployed at 500 meters depth, whereas Henson, this study is based on uh, deep sea sediment traps. Well, deep sea 2,000 meters more or less. Marseille used to derive this semi-empirical model, they used uh, more or less 10, uh, uh, 10 collections of sediment traps, whereas Henson used a global compilation of, of sediment trap data. Um, also in different locations, Marseille et al. used sediment trap data in the North Pacific and the Atlantic, whereas Henson, as I said, have a, more of a global compilation. And they all, this, this uh, um, uh, POC flux data is also collected with different methods. So whereas Henson use sediment trap, but they also use radionuclides, Marseille et al. is only based on sediment trap. So we have that depending on which observations you use to, to drive your model, you might end up with uh, opposing patterns of, of B. You, you might wonder why we also have this diverging scenario, what is the... the biogeochemical answer to, the, to these patterns. And well, we, we have that Marseille et al. came up with uh, temperature control. So we have that in the oligotrophic warmer ocean, uh, uh, metabolization rates are higher. So we end up having a shallower remineralization length scale, so high B. And uh, they also came up with a size of phytoplankton cells control. So we have that in the polar oceans, cells are larger which sink faster, which may, we end up having a deeper remineralization length scale or lower B. Whereas Henson et al, instead of invoking temperature and size of phytoplankton cells, the controls that they invoke is grazing. So we have in the oligotrophic ocean, we have 
uh, hi higher grazing control, therefore high, high production of fecal pellets, which uh, sink fast to the deeper ocean. Um, so we have a, a low B or higher transfer of POC uh, to the deep ocean. Uh, whereas in high latitudes, uh, we mostly have diatoms, which are cells that are easier to digest, more appetizing than smaller cells here in the oligotrophic ocean. So if they are more appetizing and, and easier to digest, uh, we will end up having a lower transfer of those to the deep ocean. So yeah, this is just a pure explanation of, of the controls that they invoke in these two studies. So I was making a lot of emphasis in the role of observations uh, that are used to, to derive our model results. And I, I mentioned sediment traps. So sediment traps have been used since the 80s, and those are particle interception techniques to capture particles. We have sediment traps uh, that can be surface tether, so here in, in the surface ocean, can be attached to the, to the seabed or can uh, drift with the, with the currents. We have marine snow catchers, which are mostly used uh, for particles that are suspended in the water column, where, where the sediment traps is more for those that are sinking. And we have radionuclides that are also being used. Um, so these traditional methods of collecting POC fluxes uh, give us this patchy picture, picture of uh, sediment traps, uh, sediment, sed, uh, of, uh, sediment trap flux programs that are in the ocean. So there are only around 20 time series that have been systematically collecting sediment traps uh, on a, on a, on, on, on a basis on a monthly or annual basis uh, these are time series which means that uh, signed oceanographers have been collecting those uh, fluxes um, not in one specific moment of the year and one random year but systematically month after month um, and as i say there are only around 20 in in in, in the ocean um, in the past decade, so in the last 10 years, uh, we've seen uh, the emergence of autonomous platforms. Um, so we have optical imaging and backscatter sensors. Um, so optical imaging, so the underwater vision profiler, this has been a great revolution because it allows us to measure fluxes and also uh, um, take pictures of particles. So we can see their size, uh, we can infer more or less what m materials uh, uh, contribute to the bulk of the particle. And we also have acoustic backscatter sensors that are attached to gliders. Um, so here we have the dive of a glider or biogeochemical Argo floats, which are profiling floats. Um, and these uh, autonomous platform systems, they give us a more complete more complete picture compared to the patchy one that sediment traps was giving us. The underwater vision profiler, uh, they've been de developed by Bille, in, in Villefranche um, by Ifremer, and it's been operating since 20, uh, 2008, whereas the biogeochemical Argo flow program started more recently. Um, and uh, actually, the data that I used to validate my model comes from the from the UVP because there is there is more data. This is around 500 floats uh, compared to the UVP program that has uh, data in more regions of, of the ocean. So, yeah, so, so the question that drives uh, my research and therefore the development of a Lagrangian model of particles is what, what are the mechanisms that control the attenuation of pop flux in the ocean as characterized by the Martin B. And apologies for this uh, heavy slide. It's the only one that they have in the presentation, but I had to outline the, the characteristics of the model. So this uh, model is, is SLAMS2, is a stochastic Lagrangian uh, aggregate model of sinking particles. It stems from the work of uh, Tina jokuls dotir So Tina started in Chicago in 2011 uh, with a very uh, simplified model of particles uh, coagulating in a streamlined biological carbon pump where biology was parameterized. 
um, temperature was parameterized. It was not coupled uh, to uh, biogeochemical variables. And we took that uh, model of coagulating particles and we uh, expanded it by including biology, by including phytoplankton, uh, creation driven by environmental controls, by including uh, developing a zooplankton model that encounters particles. So we have SLAMS2, uh, so it's the second, second version of the model. So this model is Lagrangian, which means that it tracks particles uh, along their trajectory since they are created and until they are destroyed. Lagrangian is a term that opposes Eulerian. So traditionally, oceanographic observations are Eulerian, meaning that they are uh, uh, fixed in a specific point in space. And from that point in space, we monitor what's happening uh, in, in the water column, whereas Lagrangian tracks the water, the, the particle along the uh, uh, vertical dimension, vertical and well, three, 3D dimension. The model is a stochastic, we, which means stochastic or probabilistic, which means that we use random sampling or the Monte Carlo method um, 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 to guess what will be the outcome of biological carbon pump processes that are highly stochastic, or also to sample parameters that are very uncertain. So we have a range of a mi minimum and a maximum value, and we use the Monte Carlo method uh, to pick up one value in between the range. These particles, by marine biogenic particles, interact with each other. Uh, so we have coagulation and also with their biogeochemical environment. So we have zooplankton grazing, microbial metabolism, photolysis, dissolution, disaggregation, and they sink along a two-dimensional water column. So it means that this model doesn't have ocean circulation yet. So that's what a two-dimensional water column. This is a work in progress. Uh, the coupling to ocean circulation will happen in, in at least hopefully in one year time. These particles carry major biogeochemical uh, materials, particulate organic carbon, calcium carbonate, biogenic silica and clay. The model resolves particle physicochemical attributes, size, density, sinking velocity, porosity, particle by particle. Um, marine snow or aggregates are built from monomers, primary particles using fractal scaling law. So you might have heard the concept of uh, fractals. So a fract fractal is a way of understanding the internal structure of a particle and um, is usually a number between one and three. So uh, a number, uh, uh, an object that has fractal dimension of one means that it is a line. If it has fractal dimension of two, it's a surface. And if it has fractal dimension of three, it's a volumetric object. And um, fractal Objects are those that have a dimension in between these, in between one, two, or three, a fraction. So marine particles are usually something between 1.2, 2.3. Um, the biological carbon pump in slums has dependencies on, 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 on various forcing, so light, net primary production, chlorophyll, uh, aeolian deposition of, of clay, nutrients, nitrate, phosphate, uh, silicic acid, we have temperature, oxygen, uh, uh, saturation by calcite, and mixed layer depth. Uh, so those are variables that we, we force the model with to drive the biological carbon pump. And therefore, the output of the model will be driven by these uh, variables, apart from the internal dynamics of the particles. Um, we have four phytoplankton, uh, we have explicitly four phytoplankton functional types, diatoms, coccolithophorids, picophytoplankton, and, and large phytoplankton that don't mineralize, and uh, 18 mesozooplankton size classes. And from the uh, statistical ensemble of particles, there emerge fluxes of these different materials, for calcium carbonate, biogenic silica, and particle number concentrations. And very importantly, this model is fast to resolve. Uh, because it, use, it uses algebraic equations and it's written in a compiled programming language, which is Fortran. So, I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to illustrate the, com the concept of Lagrangian marine particles. So we have an, an ocean box in the model and we have this fall of Lagrangian particles. And, and, and if we zoom in, 
in this computational Lagrangian particle, we will actually realize that this is a cluster of, uh, of uh, particles, these marine snow, that are identical to each other. So we have the Lagrangian particle is a computational particle that uh, clusters physical real particles that are identical to each other, meaning that they have the same physical chemical attributes of size, density, porosity. This is actually a computational trick that we use in the slums. And, and it's, it's actually it makes the model run faster and with, with uh, less computational requirements. And it, it comes from the realm of cloud physics. It's called the super droplet method. Then we have that each of these snowflakes are made by primary particle units. So each particle, which aggregate, it's made by primary particle units um, that cannot be disaggregated into uh, sub-entities. And they have a certain amount of the different uh, biogeochemical tracers. And so from the molar material composition of, of, uh, of the particle, assuming fractal scaling approach, we can derive uh, the volume of the particle, the radius, the porosity, the density, and then using a Stokes law, we can derive its, its sinking speed. Um, there are eight types of primary particles in the model. So we have the four phytoplankton functional types that I've mentioned, and they are representative of different biogeochemical provinces in the ocean. You know, they, they are perhaps the most abundant groups, uh, uh, phytoplankton groups in the marine system. Then we have TEPs, which are exudation products produced uh, by, by phytoplankton at the end of a bloom when they are stressed. So these are uh, sticky particles, or also called biological biological glue. Um, so those help to uh, keep particles together when they collide. Uh, then we have clay from Aeolian deposition. We have mesozooplankton carcasses. So actually mesozooplankton in the model, when they are modeled as particles, they are not in the living stage. Uh, the living stage is actually not modeled as a particle, only the the, the, when they die, um, they are included in the model as another particle, and then the fecal pellets that those produce. So we assume that these eight types of uh, primary particles are enough to represent the wider spectrum of marine snow that exists in the ocean. And each of those particles have a distinct composition of pulp, calcium carbonate, biogenic, biogenic silica, and clay that we introduce using a carbon quota number. So the amount of each of these materials in, in these particles. Those numbers are taken from, from the literature. So slums, uh, has all these processes embedded in it, and I'm not going to comment one by one, but basically, so we see the model with phytoplankton cells in the surface. Those produce TEP, which are those sticky particles that aid the coagulation of particles. Then we have zooplankton encountering those, those particles, fragmenting them, dissolving calcium carbonate in, in, in the acidic stomach. We have ingestion, which is the formation of fecal pellets, respiration, depth. Then we have particle coagulation, which is driven by Brownian motion, differential settling, shear stress. So those are standard equations to model coagulation of particles that come also from the atmospheric physics. Um, then we have abiotic, abiotic particle breakup or fragmentation. We also model microbial metabolism, so respiration and solubilization. We have photolysis in the surface ocean and abiotic mineral dissolution. All these processes have dependencies on uh, environmental variables uh, like you know, temperature, oxygen, macronutrients, but also on biogeochemical particle dynamics, right? So the size of the particles, the strength, the liability of the carbon, the phytoplankton community composition, zooplankton abundance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are many processes in the model that I'm only going to explain two, which are perhaps the, the ones that took most of the intellectual work, which is the seeding of phytoplankton cells in the surface ocean. So the model is forced with primary production, and the primary production actually comes from the CAFE model. Uh, so we have different algorithms that we can use to, 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 to extract uh, uh, prim, prima or 
to model primary production. So we have the BGPM algorithm, carb carbon productivity based algorithm, CAFE model. So we chose the CAFE model. Um, so using a standard equations of phytoplankton growth, uh, using uh, you know, phytoplankton cells are, are limited by light, temperature, macronutrients. And, 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 and using these environmental factors plus some photosynthetic parameters, we calculate the expected growth rate of uh, the, the four phytoplankton types that we have in the model in a particular location in the ocean with uh, which a particular amount of irradiance, temperature and macronutrients. So we calculate those, we transform these phytoplankton uh, uh, growth rates, which are division rates, into relative frequencies or probabilities which we have in this diagram. So each phytoplankton type has an assigned probability, which stems from the growth rate. And we sample these probabilities using uh, the Monte Carlo method. So the Monte Carlo method basically consists in computer generates a random number of, uh, between zero and one with a homogeneous distribution. And then, well, internally it samples uh, the, the the distribution of those uh, uh, growth rates, which have a probability distribution. And in this case, the computer gives us that the uh, phytoplankton type with, with, with the highest probability of being sampled is picophytoplankton. So we sample picophytoplankton. And now we have to transform picophytoplankton in, into cells, number of cells. So the model is driven by primary production, which is milligrams of carbon per meter square per day, and we have to transform that into number of cells of picophytoplankton in this case. So for that, I've mentioned before that uh, my primary particles have an assigned quota of material. So in this case, uh, uh, picophytoplankton have this uh, cell carbon quota, and we use this uh, um, to, we divide the, the primary production by this number uh, to calculate the number of picophytoplankton cells that we will have. And in each time step in the model, we do this, we perform this random sampling of our uh, phytoplankton distribution 20 times to ensure that we have a good coverage of the four groups of picophytoplankton. So that random sampling of the, of the four phytoplankton types give us this global distribution, which agrees well, well with observation. So we have diatoms uh, that have a higher relative abundance, so this is relative uh, abundance, in the high nutrient, low chlorophyll areas, and also the high latitude seasonal systems. Then we have picophytoplankton that dominate in the oligotrophic and tropical ocean. And then the background concentration of coccolithophorids and and flagellate, so and coccolithophorids have here a strong signal in the great calcite belt, as it is expected from observations. Okay, so that's phytoplankton. Um, then for zooplankton, zooplankton biomass is not, uh, um, has to be imposed into the model and, and has to be discretized into mesozooplankton individuals that will perform these encounters individually. So, um, there are not many observations of zooplankton biomass in the deep ocean, but recently Santiago Hernández León and company, they, they published this compilation of observations of zooplankton biomass with depth. So most of the observations of zooplankton biomass that we have from the COPEPOD database are in the first 200 meters of the ocean, but there is not much for the deep ocean to infer a general equation that predicts zooplankton biomass with depth. So these, these, these authors gather data from main biomes in the ocean and they provide some uh, fits, some regressions that allows us to calculate zooplankton biomass depending on which biome in the ocean you are. So I use this in slums to infer the zooplankton biomass in the different locations in the ocean and I distribute this uh, these biomass into size classes of, of mesozooplankton using, again, a power law. So I have a size-based approach to distribute biomass into individuals. So, you know, size, uh, the smallest mesozooplankton class to the largest mesozooplankton class. So we, we, we can infer how much carbon we have assigned to the different classes and therefore how many individuals in these uh, different categories. 
Um, and then <clears throat> we also have trophic strategies. So when zooplankton encounter particles, um, um, well, I have assumed that we can divide the trophic state of, uh, of or, or the, the behavior strategy of zooplankton to approach a particle into two main categories. So we have cruisers and ambushers. So cruisers are zooplankton that actively swim to encounter a food particle, and ambushers are passive zooplankton that wait for a particle uh, um, to approach them. And these two types, these two feeding strategies uh, have uh, um, dependence on the moment of the day, so night and day, and the depth in the water column. So cruisers tend to live during the day deep down in the water column to avoid predation by visual hunters that usually live in the, in the photic ocean. So they take shelter in the deep ocean. And then during night, they are mostly found uh, in, the, in the surface ocean when there is more abundance of food and now predators have more visual difficulties to, to catch them. Um, yeah, so <clears throat> with these feeding strategies, zooplankton encounter particles, and actually the encounters are, are, are measured using units that you couldn't use in a model to decide whether a particle is going to be encountered or not. So uh, encounters are measured in units of meter cube per second per individual. So how do you use these units, meter cube, second per individual, to infer whether the particle is going to be encountered or not? So um, this is actually, a, you know, moving from one unit to another is something that we do here in the code. Um, and uh, it can be proved that the, 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 the method we came up with to move from those units to decide whether the particle is going to be encountered or not uh, agrees with observations of ingestion rates that have been calculated for a few uh, locations in the ocean. So some results. So I, I have calibrated uh, this model. Um, so this model recreates the fluxes of POC, peak, and <laughs> biogenic silica. So I had to calibrate it or, or tune the parameters uh, using um, observations uh, from sediment traps, because sediment traps are the only observational technology that is actually capturing these three simultaneously. UVPs don't do that. They're actually images of particles. They don't tell us anything about the material composition, and the same with radionuclides. Um, so this is one condition. I, I, I need to have observations of these three simultaneously. I also need particle number concentrations to calibrate the model, so number of particles per liter. Those come from the underwater vision profiler uh, data. Um, those locations that I will use to calibrate the model must be open ocean, so away from the, from the inputs or from land. Those must be time series stations, which provide uh, quasi-climatological data. So actually, the model needs to have uh, data of POC peak and biogenic silica flux per month, because the, 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 the model can calculate an annual average, but from monthly data. Um, and yes, and, and we need data in the in the photic, in the mesopelagic, and the deep ocean. So those three depths must be covered by observations, as well as I was mentioning the temporal scale. So each month of the year, and not many locations in the ocean have data in each these three layers for each month of the year. We can actually count them with the fingers of a hand. And so I've selected uh, bats in the north northern Sargasso Sea and Ocean Station Papa here as a two, two cases to illustrate uh, this problem with the spatiotemporal scale. Um, but actually, to calibrate the model, I'm using Ocean Station Papa, but these ones that are here in bold, House Garden, Equatorial Pacific, and Porcupine Abyssal Plain, uh, because they meet all these requirements. So here is Pocflux, and here for Ocean Station Papa, on the left-hand side and, and bats on the right-hand side, we have for each month of the year, we have data at different depths. So that's the, the vertical axis. And the different color scale is for the different depths and also the different methods. So basically, we have trap data with the 
circles and the crosses for radionuclides. And uh, you can see that, for instance, in Ocean Station Papa, there is no data in the surface ocean in January, but we have data in the warmer season, in the, in, in, in the summer months, right? Whereas the, the winters are barely sampled. This is, this is a problem with the polar time series stations, that they are mostly sampled in the warmer season. Whereas BATS has data for all months of the year. BATS is a time series station that has been operating since the, the end of the 80s, and they sample, they have, the, the, their time series station is sampled bi-weekly. So they provide a good uh, climatological average of those fluxes. So, yeah, vertical and, and, and vertical resolution and, and temporal resolution is important. And also the fact that in all these different stations, not, not all of the three materials, so POC, PEAK, and biogenic silica flux, are sampled with the same amount of effort. So usually we have more uh, samples of POC than we have for biogenic silica and PEAK. So, um, and also the amount of samples that we have in the different uh, layers of the, of the column. So for the ophotic layer, we tend to have less samples than we have for the deeper ocean here in dark blue, or for the mesopelagic. When most of the remineralization in the ocean happens in the ophotic, but it is that uh, depth layer in the ocean where we have less samples, which is a paradox. Um, so here I'm, 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 I'm so slums uh, is model is uh, run on a water column basis. So we basically have the global ocean is subdivided in, in, in water columns. And here I'm showing results of running uh, slums at bats, bats only. So at one specific location. So at one specific location, we can get information of, so we have fluxes of POC, calcium carbonate and biogenic silica. And so here we have in the, the, the black line is the model output. And we have here the observation. So the model, what I'm showing here are results after optimizing uh, uh, the model against observations, so tuning parameters so that the model output fits better observations. Um, and at the same time, this optimization exercise is not only performed with flux data of these three biogeochemical tracers, but also with uh, particle number concentration data. So, um, we have that particle number concentration data can be divided into size classes of particles. Um, this is a particle size spectra, which means that uh, different size classes of particles, so here the different color lines, have a different particle number concentration. And so here are from observations. So these observations are from the underwater vision profiler that I was talking about before. So these are observations, and this is the model trying to recreate this particle size spectra. So the, the number of particles in each of these particle size categories. And the model is performing quite well because it's managing to reproduce larger size classes of particles that are actually, for some reason, not being captured. So these larger size classes here in yellow and orange, not being sampled by the underwater vision profiler. And if we sum, if we sum all of these uh, the number of particles in each size class, we have the total number of particles. So we have total number of particles modeled in this black line and the, 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 the total numbers that we get from, from observation. So the model is performing relatively well, considering that we are trying to uh, fit model outputs to particle number concentrations and particle fluxes at the same time. Only a Lagrangian, Lagrangian model of particles can, can do that. Um, the model produces a myriad of outputs, and actually I don't have observations for all the outputs that it produces. So it can tell us, uh, so for the, uh, for the uh, water column, uh, we have the different sinks of carbon, which are, so the different mechanisms that degrade carbon, so we have microbial respiration, zooplankton respiration, right? So we have uh, which process, which uh, uh, heterotrophic process is responsible uh, uh, for most of the sink of carbon. 
We can also look at the different particle types by depth, so the different particle types that are in the slums and how many of them we have along depth. So most of the particles in the surface ocean are phytoplankton cells, and then when we go deeper down into the ocean, the particle type that makes up most of the particle composition are single particles, are actually large aggregate particles are very rare in, in the ocean. Um, we also have, uh, so for instance, zooplankton, when, when they encounter particles, three things can happen. Particles can be fragmented, can be omitted, or can be ingested. So here we have an estimate of the amount of fragmentation. So this is like a relative, uh, this is a fraction from, from zero to one. So how much, or, uh, how much of the attenuation due to zooplankton grazing is due to fragmentation? How much due to ingestion? Um, th th there are no estimates, there are no numbers of uh, observational, or at least I'm not aware of, general general observations for these quantities and then we can also look at profiles of uh, of metabolism right so zooplankton uh, solubilization ingestion respiration so along the water column um, how much these processes contribute to the degradation of 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 carbon and this is the last slide so if we run slums on a global scale, so I said I, 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 I have compartmentalized the model in water columns in the ocean, and if we, if we run the model for each of these water columns, we produce a global picture. So before, I was telling you that in the modeling literature, we have two schools of thought regarding the distribution, the global distribution of Martin B, and this is what slums produces. And this pattern of, uh, that we produce in slums with B higher in the, in, in the oligotrophic and tropical oceans and lower in polar areas agrees well with the pattern proposed by, by Marcy. This is actually a result that was produced with a zooplankton model that was much more simple than the one that I've shown you before. So when I finish optimizing the model and I run it again on a global scale, I, I might obtain hopefully the similar pattern with a better resolution than the one that I'm showing here. And, and uh, when I analyzed the sensitivity that the model output produced by SLAMS had to different environmental factors and particle dynamic factors, I, I could conclude that the, 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 the processes that are driving this pattern, the processes controlling the biological carbon pump, the efficiency of the biological carbon pump, uh, were primary production and relative uh, percentage of diatoms. Marseille was invoking temperature and the size of phytoplankton cells. Henson was invoking grazing and liability of carbon. So, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, I'm not saying, oh, it's just primary production and diatoms, because actually the pattern of primary production and diatoms is also controlled by temperature. And we also know that diatoms are labile and are also larger than other cells. So it's a bit of everything. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So, some take-home messages. Um, so we know the biological carbon pump reduces atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, sinking marine particles are the, mechanist the mechanistic units of the biological carbon pump and need to be brought to the deep ocean to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. Uh, observations of the biological carbon pump are, are patchy in the spatial and temporal scale. And we need autonomous technologies to help us to increase the resolution uh, of, of the frequency and the, and, the, and the spatial scale of this sampling. We still don't know what uh, biogeochemical controls drive the, the carbon sink in the ocean mediated by the biological carbon pump. We have conflicting modeling studies like the School of Thought of Marseille and the School of Thought of Henson, which are based on different observational data sets. So depending on which, day, on which observations you use to drive or calibrate your model, you might end up having different results. This is, this is a big problem. Um, so SLAMS, a stochastic model of Lagrangian marine particle, shows that Martin, the global pattern of Martin B is driven by net primary production and diatom relative abundance. Um, so there was another slide for, for future work, but... Uh, I didn't ha have time to write it down, so I'm just going to say this out loud. So 
slums is, is an ongoing project and uh, right now I'm, I'm looking for uh, applications of it. Um, so I, I was thinking because current application of slums is answering what controls the, the pattern of the attenuation rate of poke flux with depth. Uh, but I was thinking that other relevant questions for which this model could be used for I was thinking of, for instance, coastal systems where, the, where, where there is a high sedimentation of particles. A model of Lagrangian particles can have potential to answer some relevant questions to engineers, for instance. Um, I would like also to expand my observational data set of, of uh, observations of POC, calcium carbonate, uh, and bioge biogenic silica flux. This is actually something that I've done my own compiling all these observations. I was looking for quasi-climatological data, and this is something rare to have in the ocean. Yes, we've sampled the ocean in many locations, but it's been like a punctual sampling at a specific moment of the year in a specific year. It's not a time series, because these, these models need climatological data, so it needs data in each month of the year to be compared with. And so that's the ideal case scenario to, to validate a model like, 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 like such. So if you have any ideas of anyone that might be putting together uh, data sets of fluxes of, of particles, like the one that I'm looking for, or someone that will be willing to help to do this global compilation of particle flux data, uh, I will be very happy. Um, yeah, so yeah, so with that, uh, I can take some questions if you have some. <laughs>